Well, we're going to explore one of the four Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. And uh, you'll discover, why are there four Gospels? Have you ever wondered about that? It's not incidental, by the way. The Holy Spirit determined before the foundation of the world that there would be these four portraits of the Lord, each portrait from a slightly different perspective. He took four men and prepared them, each of them, to tell the story of Jesus Christ, each in his own particular way. And uh, Matthew, of course, focuses on the promised one is here, speaks of his credentials, quotes from the Old Testament, presents the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark, this is how he worked. You're going to see his power here. Luke, this is what he was like. He's a doctor. He was interested in his human nature. And John, focus on who he really was, his godship. If we study, as we study the four Gospels, we'll discover that each one is skillfully designed to focus on a particular emphasis. Matthew presents the Messiah, the line of the tribe of Judah. Mark is going to focus on his servanthood. Luke, the fact that he's son of man, his humanity. And John, that he's the son of God. And so, in support of each of these themes, there's a genealogy in three of them. Matthew, being a good Jew, starts his genealogy from Abraham, presents the legal gene genealogy of Jesus Christ. Mark is the one of the four that has no genealogy because we don't worry about the pedigree of our servants, do we? That's incidental. Luke is a doctor. He focuses on the fact that Jesus was the son of Adam, son of man. And he starts at Adam and builds the genealogy all the way through to Jesus Christ. Now John has a genealogy that most people don't recognize. It's the genealogy of the pre-existent one. The first three verses of the gospel talks about his pre-existence. Matthew just focuses on what Jesus said. Mark what he did. Luke on what he felt. You see the emotions there better than all the others. And John focused on who he was, his deity. Matthew writes to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek, and John to the church. In support of those themes, Matthew's first miracle is a leper cleansed. That's a very Jewish kind of thing, because leprosy was a type of sin, if you will. Mark's first miracle is a demon expelled, as is Luke, a demon expelled. Both are Gentile focus, if you will. John has a very different focus. Water turned to wine, a very mystical miracle there. Each of these Gospels conclude in accordance with their theme. Matthew concludes with the resurrection. Mark with the ascension. Luke with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and that's, of course, setting up his sequel to volume two of Luke called the Book of Acts. John closes with the promise of his return and that, of course, sets up his sequel, the book of Revelation. You see the fingerprints of design all the way through these things. Now, if you study these things, you know that the camp of Israel had four sides, and the ensign of Judah, Ephraim, Reuben, and Dan marked those four sides, and the, the, their symbols for their ensigns were the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And it's been recognized from the early church on that those four faces of the cherubim, or those four ensigns of the four camps of Israel uh, reflect the four Gospels. Matthew, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark, the ox was the traditional uh, emblem of service. Luke, the man, and John, the eagle. And so the styles are very different. Matthew has groupings. Mark has snapshots. It's like a shooting script. It's very visual, very action-oriented. Luke's a narrative, and of course John is the, is, is the mystic of the bunch. When we study the book of Leviticus, the first seven chapters, you can see a parallelism. Uh, the burnt offering, the death of our Lord is, is the, was the, in effect the burnt offering glorifying the Father in the scene where he had been so dishonored by sin. Luke as the peace offering, that man may have fellowship with the fa Father. And Matthew, whose theme is the government of God, identifies the work of the cross with the trespass offering, where the Lord could say, as, as he does in Psalm 69, then I restored that which I took not away. And Mark, the sin offering, is before us. Christ dying not only for trespasses committed, but because we are sinners by nature, uh, which, makes, which our practice makes evident. So those are a parallelism of the four with those four basic offerings. But 
Mark was unique in many ways. You may remember that Barnabas and Paul returned from Jerusalem in the book of Acts when they had fulfilled their ministry and they took with them John whose surname was Mark. John Mark was his name. And pa Paul and Barnabas, uh, uh, Saul, later called Paul, uh, and Barnabas took them along. So they also took John with them to what? To minister. So Mark is going to minister. Now the word minister in the Bible has a number of different uh, words that use that. Angelos means a messenger, ministering spirit if you will. Apostolos, so that's one cent, like a delegate or apostle. Uh, Deaconos, from which you get the word deacon, is one who executes the commands of another, who serves, if you will. And liturgos, which is a public minister. That's where we get the word liturgy in, in, this, in the church. But there's a fourth level of minister. It's the lowest level of minister. He's the, the, the uh, hooper, it's, it's a under rower, is what the term actually means. It's the lowest of all ranks. It was the lowest rank of the slave positioned in the most difficult spot with the most unwieldy oar in a, in a, in a, in a uh, barge, if you will. The common work hand. He's the subordinate. He's the, low, he's the most menial laborer. Guess which word is used of Mark as a minister? The lowest level. He's the one that's used, the one used to refer to Mark. The under rower, if you will. Now Mark's background is probably worth understanding. He was the son of a wealthy woman, we understand, named Mary probably a widow, whose home was large enough to serve as a meeting place for many of the early disciples' uh, initial uh, uh, meetings and, of course, in the outpouring in Acts chapter 2, 12. And uh, the rich young ruler questioning Christ about he, what he needed to do in inherit life. Remember that? That will show up in Mark 10. Uh, many suspect that that rich young ruler is Mark himself, by the way. And uh, that's, Mark includes a detail that Matthew and Luke failed to mention. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him. That's a detail Mark adds in his rendering of that in Mark chapter 10 when we get there. So that's why from the early church on, they suspected, they don't know this, but they suspect that young, rich young ruler may have been Mark himself. And uh, so he may have been that rich man. An early church tradition also suggests that, it, that Mark was a certain young man who followed Christ right up to his entry into the house of the high priest. And then when the guards tried to lay hold of him, he left the linen cloth that he's clothed in in their hands and he ran off naked. And that's in Mark 14. He's the only one that records that. And so uh, we suspect that he may have also uh, been that uh, uh, <laughs> a young guy that ran off naked. So, But uh, Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Cyprus, but he later returned to Jerusalem which under conditions which caused Paul to feel betrayed. He felt that he just didn't have... When Paul and Barnabas were going to go off to Galatia, which is a pretty rough country, Mark lost his nerve and went home. And uh, that really upset uh, uh, Paul. He felt abandoned. So he refused to take him, that is Mark, on the second journey. And that became a bitter quarrel between Paul and Barnabas. See, Mark was, re was related to Barnabas, probably a cousin, by the way. Some King James Version says nephew, but the word in, used in Colossians actually refers perhaps to a cousin situation. In any case, Paul and Barnabas had quite a, a feud over, the, the, uh, over uh, Mark's behavior. But Paul and Mark later on do get reconciled. Because when he was in prison in Rome, Mark served as his aide and then a delegate to an important mission in Asia Minor. It's all in, uh, in the, it shows up in the epistles. And Paul would later ask Timothy to bring Mark back with him to Rome because he was useful in service. So much for that. When Peter was writing 1 Peter, he affectionately called Mark his son. So we suspect that Peter regarded Mark very specially. He may have been the one that originally led Mark to the Lord. So that's a speculation. But it certainly was Mark's intimacy with Peter that results in his gospel. Many people regard the gospel of Mark as essentially Peter's gospel, with Mark acting as a secretary as an, or as an amanuensis or a stenographer, if you will. So uh, that's, a, that's a widely held view. The gospel that we're going to look at is a gospel, it's like a shooting script. It's very different than the other. It's like a uh, design for a movie or a teleplay because it moves rapidly through a series of, of scenes, visual images, all emphasizing action. And Mark continually overuses a word, euthios, which is usually translated in English as immediately, straight away forthwith, anon, in other words, immediately connecting. They're 
words of action, if you will. It appears over 40 times in this, uh, in this the gospel. It, about the, it only appears about that uh, 40 times in the entire New Testament, other than the Mark, Mark. It occurs only seven times in Matthew and only once in Luke. It's an unusual construction. Very conspicuous, we'll see, in this gospel. Mark uses also a form of expression called historical present tense 150 times. Jesus comes, Jesus says, Jesus heals. They're all expressed as if it's happening right now in present tense. Writers call that the historical present tense. Obviously it happened a long time ago, but it's written as if it's happening now. It's a style of writing that Mark indulges in. And uh, there are more miracles recorded in Mark than any of the other Gospels, even though it's the shortest one. Mark's the shortest on the one hand, records the most miracles on the other. Matthew's Gospel seems longer than Mark's only because Matthew takes down a number of the big discourses verbatim. If you take the discourses out of Matthew, it's shorter than Mark. Most people don't realize that. It's interesting that in just 20 verses, 20 short verses within chapter 1, we're going to discover, he describes the ministry of John the Baptist, Jesus' baptism, his temptation in the wilderness, and the call of the disciples are all crammed into 20 little verses. So he just zips through that stuff pretty quickly. Some people look at it as a, it's a gospel for the Roman mind. This purpose was to write down the gospel as Peter had presented it to the Romans. And uh, at least that's the tradition that's in the early church, the early fathers. and Some of the internal evidence will also support that perspective. Now that the gospel was for Gentiles can be seen from a number of cases from the translation of Aramaic expressions all through Mark, we find words that are not really Hebrew, they're actually Aramaic words. Boanerges, uh, Talitha Kumi, Corban, Bartimaeus, Abba, Golgotha. Those are all Aramaic expressions, by the way, borrowed from, a, from, a, from the Chaldean, if you will. And uh, another reason is there's an explanation of Jewish customs several places in chapter 14 and 15 which implies, since Mark's explaining these Jewish customs, that his audience was non-Jewish. That's why they see it as a Roman audience. See? From the fact that the law is not mentioned. And the Old Testament is only quoted once in Mark's narrative. That's very different, say, the, just the opposite, say Matthew, which is clearly write, written to the Jews and draws heavily continually on the Old Testament references. Now, the other reasons, it also, there's Gentile sections, especially in Mark 6 through 8 in here, so... That it was for the Romans is also seen in the explanation of a Greek term with a Latin term in Mark 12. That the preponderance of works of power, an emphasis on authority and patient and heroic endurance, these are all values that were high to the Romans. It forbids a practice that was not Jewish but Roman. It forbids a practice that was a Roman practice, not Jewish. So those that, as many believe that it was written at Rome, they find further hints at the mention of Rufus, and uh, both there and also in the epistle of Paul's epistle to the Romans, and uh, the resemblance uh, between Mark 7 and Romans 14. Those parallelisms caused many scholars to see it having a very uh, Roman uh, flavor. The Roman centurion's remark in Mark 15 is the style of the author and bears the same relation to Mark's purpose as John's. John, in uh, his gospel, chapter 20, he explains the re reason he wrote the gospel that you might believe that Jesus was the Christ and so forth. Well, Mark expresses a similar um, uh, uh, purpose uh, in, in his closing chapters. So that's just by way of background. Uh, let's just jump right in and take a look at the book. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He opens right there, puts it right in front of us. The gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the, what is the gospel, by the way? We use that term so casually. It's not a philosophy. It's not a system of morality. A gospel is the history of a person, namely Jesus Christ, obviously. It's a, per it's a person who is the focus and fulcrum of the entire history of the entire universe. That's what we're really dealing with here. The gospel is defined, if anybody else wants to pre press that point, it's defined in the first four verses of the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. How? And he mentions three things. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the 
third day according to the scriptures. What's astonishing about Paul's definition of the gospel, it makes no mention of his teachings, his example, all those kinds of things. No, no. It's that he came to serve on a mission. That he died according to the scriptures. He didn't just die. He didn't just disappear. He died according to the scriptures. He fulfilled a hundred specifications in his death. That he was buried. Only Paul emphasizes that as part of the gospel because he builds a whole case about baptism on that. And thirdly, that he rose again on the third day according to scripture. That distinguishes him from every other person in human history. He actually rose from the dead. Now it's interesting that the gospel we're talking about here is, is tragically absent from too many pulpits. It's astonishing how many churches you can go to where you don't hear the gospel preached from the pulpit. That's, that's, that's one of the great failings of the church today. Facts without purpose behind them are meaningless. So that's really what we're going to be chasing here in the Gospel of Mark. Okay. Love that goes upward is adoration. Love that goes outward is affection. Love that goes downward that stoops is grace. Those are, that's the molecule, if you will, of love. The gospel of the grace of God is what Mark is going to present to us. In Mark, we clearly see the glory of God is not only to be found in his power, his majesty, his might, and, his, and dominion. The true glory of God is in his grace. We're going to see that exemplified all through this gospel. The true glory of God is not the awesome attributes that separate his inconceivable nature from us. It's not the eternity of his existence. It's not the infinitude of his being. It's not the omnipotence of his unwearied arm, nor his omniscience that sees to the heart of us. But rather, the glory of God is the lowliness and death of Jesus Christ. That is going to be the crowning glory of God, God's love, his grace. Strange inversion in there, but we want to be sensitive to it right up front. The f main theme within Mark's gospel is servanthood. He's going to emphasize Jesus as the suffering servant. You know, it's interesting that Jews had theory of two Messiahs. They looked through the Old Testament and they saw a Messiah that was the suffering servant. They called that the Mashiach ben Yosef. They also saw the ruling king, the Messiah ben David. And they thought there were two Messiahs. They didn't realize those were two roles of one Messiah. And uh, 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 Rabbi uh, Itzhak Kaduri, the most venerated ultra-Orthodox rabbi of them all, shocked the community by leaving. After he died, he left word that the two Messiahs are one. He recognized that. But we're going to focus on, in a sense, the Messiah ben Yosef, the, the servanthood. And, and uh, one cannot escape the feeling that we have in this gospel, the antitype of the servant of Yorhei Vavhe. It's not strange that this servant emphasis this remarkable blend of strength and submission, achieving victory through apparent defeat, should appeal to Peter. Doesn't sound like Peter? He knew victory and knew defeat. See, Peter himself was ardent, whole-souled man, I like that term, who knew both defeat and victory. Moreover, he himself had hired servants. We're going to discover in this first chapter, look at it, Peter had servants. Did you know that? He and his father had a fishing business. They had servants. And we'll talk about that when we get there. See, and now for years he had been a servant of Christ. That's Peter talking. That did appeal to him and he became familiar with the early Christians can be seen from Acts 3 to 4 and so forth. Peter was a, a servant and Mark picks up on all of that. But temperamentally then, Mark seems to have been like Peter and his experience in a wealthy home. Where, sorry, he, he grew up in a wealthy home. Mark was a young man, grew up in a wealthy home. He understood having servants. He understood what the roles of servants were. That's why he calls himself a who parites the, uh, the lowest of servants of apostles in Christian service. Fitted him both to do, uh, appreciate and record the character and doings of the perfect servant, namely Jesus Christ, the perfect servant and the Father. So Mark's going to have that focus, that emphasis, that perspective. Mark's focus is servanthood. And that'll be all the way through here. The key verse will be Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered into, unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, the ultimate service. So that's his summary of the whole thing right there in 1045. We're introduced to the God who, in the words of Paul, Paul 
expresses it differently in the Philippians, the famous thing called the kenosis. Who being in the form of God, thought it not something to be grasped, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's Paul's description of Jesus Christ in Philippians 2. And it's so famous it has a name of its own, the kenosis, if you will. But anyway, again, focus of servanthood. Let's get down to verse 2. We're actually making progress here. As it is written in the prophets, Mark says, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And he's quoting Malachi 3.1. If you look at Malachi 3.1, God says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. That's a prediction, of course, of John the Baptist, the one that's coming before Christ. Okay? And then he gets the next verse. He says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Again, Mark is quoting from Isaiah 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway of God. He's basically quoting that from Isaiah. And the word translated Lord in your English Bible is actually the Tetragrammaton. The yod heh vav -he, the unpronounceable name of God. Moving on to verse 4. John did baptize in the wilderness. Now he's speaking here, of course, John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now so understand the baptism of John is different than the baptism later. We're gonna, this is the baptism of repentance. That's what John was preaching there. John came and began to baptize in the desert, proclaiming baptism as a mark of complete change of heart and recognition of the need for forgiveness of sins. That was John's focus. And it's from that focus we get so confused. Why was Christ baptized at all? Because he didn't have to change his heart. He didn't have to get forgiveness of sins. Why is he getting baptized? See, what is the meaning of baptism, first of all? The origin of the word baptism precede any concept of immersion in water, by the way. That comes later. 500 years before Christ, the word immerse it was used to describe the process of turning a piece of blink, a pink cloth into blue cloth or a yellow cloth into black cloth. The process of cleaning and dyeing is what the term actually meant. The dyer was called the Baptist. You took your cloth to Sam the Baptist to change its appearance and hence its identity. It's a, the baptism was an identity. Moving on. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem were all baptized of him, speaking of John the Baptist, in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. So John is having people come and confess their sins. What is strange about this verse? Well, if you are in Jerusalem, and you want to go hear John preach in the, in the, the Jordan, you're talking about a 20-mile walk. No bus lines, no rent-a-cars. Most people didn't have the beast of burden. They walked. Can you imagine walking 20 miles to hear a preacher? In fact, there are so many of them going out to hear John, the temple is puzzled. Because it just isn't a few people. There's a whole mob going walking 20 miles to hear this guy preach. And, and what was his preachment? Repent, you sinner. You know. And so, there are so many attending these gatherings, walking over 20 miles, that the temple authorities sent an inquiry team. That's what in John's gospel, he focuses on the details there. They want to know what's going on. Now, why would so many people travel so far to hear a preacher? I want to share with you a legend. This is not in the scripture. It's just a legend, but it's kind of colorful. Okay? Next verse says, John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. So he's a, a mountain man here, right? But I want to tell you there's a legend about the mantle of Elijah. You remember Elijah had this fantastic career in the Old Testament. So fantastic that his protege, Elisha, coveted having Elijah's mantle. And when Elijah is finally taken by God into heaven, 
his mantle falls upon Elisha. Elisha's prayer was that he would have a double portion. Elijah obviously had the Holy Spirit. Elisha wanted a double portion. And if you study the career of Elijah, you'll discover there were eight miracles that are prominent in his life. When you study Elisha, there are 16 of them. He got a double portion, apparently. But this mantle devolves on Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, deals with that. Here's what the, that, that's in the scripture. Here's the legend that when Elisha dies, they took Elijah's mantle that he'd been wearing and put it, stowed it in the holy place, in fact, in the golden altar. There's a little three foot high, one foot square little thing where they did the incense altar, right? They put his mantle in this little um, uh, cupboard. That's the, that's the legend. In the New Testament, Zechariah is due to, in, in, on duty, and the angel explains to him that he's going to have a son, so forth. What's not in the scripture, but the legend has it, that he took that mantle with him when he went home. And when his son is born, and he grows up to be John the Baptist, that John the Baptist actually inherited the mantle of Elijah. That's just a legend. I don't know if it's true. It's certainly colorful. But it is suggestive because whether it's true or it just became the rumor, the reason people walked 20 miles to hear him, they heard that he has the mantle of Elijah on him. Not just the spirit of him or the style of him, that there's something special going on here. That is the, the theory, the, the legend, that John was actually wearing the mantle of Elijah. Is it true? Don't know. Is it colorful? Enough so I had to share it with you. But moving on now, verse 7. And John preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So he's pointing out he's just the messenger. He's just the advanced guy, see? John continues, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. Now that puzzles a lot of people. Why should Jesus have to be baptized? He's not a sinner. By the way, this latch of the shoes. You, I'm just going to give you a footnote here. When you're in the mood to, do a study of shoes in the scripture. Shoes have a very strange role. When they wandered in the wilderness, their shoes did not wear out. In the book of Ruth, shoes become a, a marriage license for Boaz. Shoes have, you might want to, it's sometimes useful to take a concept and follow it right through the Bible and discover that it links up. And uh, so you can study what, called, what a rabbi would call a remes, a hint of something deeper. Shoes are on your feet, they speak of your walk. And there's a number of places to look through, and you can get a concordance and track it down. It'll be a fun little study. But why was Christ baptized? That's a more fundamental question here. It even seemed to John that there was a contradiction in Jesus' baptism. Matthew records John's protest. John didn't think it was appropriate for it. You know, and it would seem to contradict the truth of the announcement. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's sin free. So why is he baptized? See, every year, Jewish families would choose a Passover lamb and examine it with care to make sure it was free of any spotted blemish. And they would take it into their home for three days and then they'd kill it for, in the celebration of Passover. And here's the Passover. The, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Why is he baptized? Jesus was baptized to be identified with his sinful people under the law of God. That's his way of identifying himself with us. Galatians 4 deals with this. Verse 4 and 5. When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth His Son, made of woman, made under the law, to redeem them who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So Jesus was voluntarily identifying Himself as a man, undertaking the obligation to fulfill the requirements of the law to accomplish His purpose. What was His purpose? To save His people from their sin. So that was the beginning. That's really what was going on here. Moving on, verse 10. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. Like a dove. Interesting phrase. Interesting phrase. We often speak of the poet's dove. The dove that abandoned Noah. Remember Noah, that dove left him, let him know that the flood was over. The dove that did not rest on Abraham because he lied. He did not rest on Moses because he failed. 
He did not rest on David. He sinned. Who did he rest on? Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit came upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, can you imagine this? A voice from heaven. Glib little phrase. Think about that for a minute. There's a crowd around. And Jesus is there getting baptized. This Spirit comes down on him like a dove. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When else did he say that? At the, at the uh, Transfiguration, huh? So it's interesting. That happens several times. Tre check it out. My beloved Son, the word beloved there, akipetos, it not only declares affection, it carries the meaning of the, only, the one and only. The one and only. Now three years later, at the Mount of Transfiguration, as Moses and Elijah also stood beside him, once more a voice out of heaven used these very same words. In Matthew 17, it'll show up in Mark 9. Okay? And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. What happens right after the baptism? Spirit drives Jesus into the wilderness. And what happens in the wilderness? He's in the wilderness for 40 days without eating, fasting. He was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered him. Now here, in just a, a couple of phrases, Math, uh, Mark just summarizes a number of details. You can find the details of this in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Matthew 4 and Luke 4 has the details of Christ's temptation in the wilderness. Forty days. Now for, these days are, uh, are suggest, suggestive of the 40 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness. In any case, having triumphed over the enemy, Jesus, that is Yehoshua, if you will, could now go forth and call a new people who would enter into their spiritual inheritance. The temptation. See, the other parallel is that of the last Adam. That's what Paul uses in, the, in 1 Corinthians 15. The last Adam succeeding where the first Adam had failed. Adam lost his dominion over creation because of his sin in Genesis uh, 1. And, uh, but in Christ, that the dominion has been restored for all who trust him. Hebrews 2. Now, after that, John was put it. Now, after that, see, he, he just summarized this very quickly. He just zipped through those, you know, the whole temp all that. And just, Mark just jumps ahead. Now after that, John, that's John the Baptist, was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now here Mark passes over a full year of Jesus' ministry. So this is, a, this is a, just a summary kind of thing. Herod had imprisoned John the Baptist in the Machera uh, prison. It was then that Jesus began his Galilean ministry. He announces mandate from Isaiah 61 at the synagogue in Nazareth. All that's recorded in Luke chapter 4. And continuing, and Jesus and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So that's the call of Peter, here called Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were both fishermen. Notice it was the Lord Jesus who took the initiative. And this wasn't their initial call to faith. It was their first call to discipleship. There's some subtleties there when you start looking at the Gospels to try to fit that all together. And straightway, there's that word again, straightway. You notice how often that comes straightway, immediately? That's, that's Mark's style. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. So we've got two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew, and uh, James and John, sons of Zebedee, who have a nickname called the Sons of Thunder. But anyway, and straightway, there's that word again, and straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee and the ship in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. So these guys were not poor fishermen. We think of that as, you know, they had servants. They, had, they were in business. They had a fishing business. And they had 
servants that le- they when they left they left their servants with their father their father was was had still had help and apparently there's many uh, as many as seven of the lord's disciples were fishermen in a very dominant trade in that region of course so it's not surprising and they went into Capernaum. Caper, Caper is a village, is the village of Nahum. Capernaum is the village of Nahum. And straightway, on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And this is, by the way, where the Lord and his mother and his brethren apparently moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. So Capernaum was now his hometown. That's mentioned both Matthew 4 and John 2. But I want you to notice Mark doesn't focus on the, those, that background detail. He focuses on deeds, not words. That's going to be his style. It's really a shooting script. Now synagogues could be formed whenever there were at least 10 Jewish men above the age of 12. That's what made a, minion, a minimum of a synagogue. Paul always took advantage of the opportunities on Shabbat to teach at the synagogue in Acts 13 and 14 and 17 and so on. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. Very different style. He spoke with authority, and they picked up on that. He didn't say, thus saith the Lord, like like, uh, Isaiah might, but rather, verily, verily, I say unto you. Jesus unabashedly speaks with authority, and they pick up on that. It puzzles them, but they pick up on that. There's no other person in the history, in history, who has the right to speak that way. Only Christ can speak for God, because he is God. I say, verily, verily, I say unto you. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Now here the, in Mark, the first miracle you're going to see is a demon being cast out here. A man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. That actually is a very startling verse. Jesus has not declared to the public that he's the Son of God. Um, The demons recognize who he is. The demons recognize who he is. And uh, so evil is not to be left alone. I want you to notice the plural here. The demons speak out of this guy saying, let us alone. Plural, not singular. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. The word hold thy peace, that's, that's King James language. Be muzzled is what he said. Okay? Fimo in the Greek. Be muzzled. So Jesus rebuked him. The Lord did not desire testimony from demons. He would use the same terms when he stills the storm in chapter 4. In chapter 4 he's going to rebuke the storm. And he's going to use that same word. Fimu, be muzzled, you know, be still. And uh, so the unclean spirit comes out. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, what, is th- what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. The onlookers are watching, and they're shook up, understandably. And immediately, there's that word again, it's always straightway, immediately. So immediately his fame spread abroad throughout the region round about Galilee. See, Jesus did not welcome this kind of superficial public excitement. He had, didn't have any press agents here. Because he didn't want to create problems with both the Jews and the Romans. He didn't want any premature publicity here. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So you've got two pairs of brothers here. They enter in the house, and they're in Capernaum, okay? They had moved there from Nazareth, apparently. See, originally, these brethren lived in Bethsaida. 
It may have been after Simon's marriage that he moved to Capernaum, possibly to share the home of his wife's mother. We'll pick that up uh, later on. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. The word anon isn't a common term in our English. It was in the old English. It is, again, that same word of euthios. Again, straightway, immediately, anon. Right then. In other words, it's it, it just moving along is the point. That's Mark's style. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. So she raises, he raises her, and she then turns and ministers to them. He took her by the hand. See, Mark also notices that same phrase in Jairus' daughter in chapter 5, the blind man in Mark 8, the demon-possessed child in Mark 9, and picking up the child in Mark 9. He, 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 we need to take people by the hand. That seems to be something Mark emphasizes. Service. It wasn't just with words. It was, it was uh, getting involved. And, he, and at even, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. Notice there's two groups there. The people who are diseased are one group. The people who are possessed by devils are another. Don't presume that this possessed with devils is a euphemism for psych psychiatric disorders. Not at all. These creatures are very sentient. They are knowledgeable. They are, are dangerous. And uh, they recognized Christ when he hadn't even told the public who he was. The scripture differentiates the diseased from the possessed. Understand that. Continuing, And all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. See, there it is. It wasn't just that one case. That apparently was the general rule. These devils understood who he was. And he told them to shut up. He didn't want that. He didn't want testimony of, devil, uh, of devils. But he healed many that were sick of various diseases, but he also cast out devils. And so uh, the crowd start to assemble. huh? He would not receive testimony from the hosts of the evil one. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. You know, it's interesting to discover that Jesus is always praying. He stays up late at night, praying. Gets up early while it's still dark, praying. Here is the incarnation of God himself. And he feels a need to almost be continually in prayer. What a sobering lesson for each of us. The late hours of the night before he could not, that he did not defer his appointed meeting with his father in the early morning hours. Jesus was always praying. Sometimes all night. And certainly at the beginning of the day. It was his discipline, the discipline in his prayer life that was the key to his power in the minds of many, many uh, scholars. Not praying is like planning a long trip without taking time to put oil in the engine. <laughs> and Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next town, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. See, he wasn't, he didn't stick around because there's good crowds here. They had, he's been done, been there, done that, moving on to the next town. He did not alter his priorities simply because he became popular in that area. That didn't change his, his priorities at all. And he preached in the synagogues throughout all Galilee, that whole northern area, and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Interesting. Leprosy, of course, was a dreaded disease and regarded as incurable. And in those days it may very well have been. Not as, it isn't today, but it was then. And they, uh, here comes a leper who somehow just knows that he has the power to make him clean. See, leprosy, by the way, there are two types or idioms of sin in the scripture. Uh, leaven is one of them that we always deal with around the feasts of Moses and so on. The other one is leprosy. is regarded by scholars as a type of sin. Why? It's deeper than just skin deep. It shows up on the skin, but it's deeper than skin deep. 
it spreads, it defiles and isolates, and it renders things only fit for the fire. And that's all, that's all extracted from Leviticus 13 if you want to dig into that. Let's talk a little bit about leprosy so we understand it. It's an infectious disease that is characterized by disfiguring skin sores, nerve damage, and progressive debilitation. Its symptoms include skin lesions that are lighter than your normal skin color. Lesions have decreased sensation to the touch, heat, or pain. One of the problems they have is they can put their hand in a, in a fire and not know it because the nerves no longer, there's no more pain. The lesions do not heal after several weeks to months. And the, one of their biggest problems is if they step on a, on, a, on a nail or something, it goes through the foot. They don't know it. They don't sense it. Numbness, absent sensation in the hands, arms, feet, and legs. Muscle weakness. These are all things. Leprosy comes from the Greek lepe, which is the meaning scales on a fish. It's also sometimes called Hansen's disease. It is caused by uh, the organism Mycobacterium leprae. That's just the name of the bacillus. It's not very contagious and has a very long incubation period, which makes it difficult to determine where or when the disease was contracted. All forms of disease eventually cause peripheral neurological damage, which causes sensory loss in the skin and muscle weakness. People with long-term leprosy may lose the use of their hands or feet due to the repeated injury resulting from a lack of sensation. To give you current, in 1995, the World Health Organization estimated that between 2 and 3 million people were permanently disabled because of leprosy. In the past 20 years, 15 million people worldwide have been cured of leprosy. Today, the diagnosis and treatment of leprosy is easy. There are a number of antibiotics that deal with it if they can get treatment. And although the forced quarantine and segregation of patients is not unnecessary, in places where adequate treatments are available, many leper colonies still remain around the world. But that's really obsolete. Uh, with treatment, they can be cured today because of modern medicine. Let's move on, though. Verse 41. And Jesus moved with compassion. Boy, how important that is, huh? And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will. Be thou clean. So Jesus accedes to the request for healing. Jesus looks upon him, apparently evidences his compassion for the predicament of this person. He put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. See, lepers were supposed to keep their distance. This one moved right up there. God has made it abundantly clear that he is not willing that sinners perish. 2 Peter 3 deals with that. And that he is willing that all men be saved, but it's up to them to accept what he's done for them. Mark, for, uh, verse 40, we're just getting down to the end here. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was clean, cleansed. That certainly must have shocked that audience. They're familiar with these, these symptoms. They're familiar with the incurability to them of this malady, and he dramatically uh, uh, deals with that. He was cleansed and so are we. We're in the same boat. Our leprosy is our sin, our sin nature. And Jesus can, can, can uh, deal with that also. And he straightly charged him and forth, forthwith sent him away. And he saith unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. See, in other words, he doesn't want this guy running around and stirring up the crowd. All he wants him to do is what he was required by the law to do. If you were, if you were healed, in, in the Torah, it requires you to go to the priest, show yourself that you have been cleansed, and, and give a, a Thanksgiving offering for doing that. And uh, so that was required by the law. So he's telling this guy, say nothing to any man, but go that way and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded. In other words, com com you know, comply with the law or testimony to them. 
This is required in Leviticus 14. And what, the, what he typically had to do, there was an offering of two birds. Jesus, one represented Jesus' incarnation and death. The, the bird in the jar is killed. The other one is turned loose, stained with blood and then set free. And that's to, to model the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the procedure described in Leviticus 14. See, the blood was applied to the man's right ear, his right thumb, and his right big toe. The ear meant God's word, the right thumb meant God's work, and the big toe meant God's walk. That's the idioms that are being communicated here by the application of the blood described there in Leviticus 14. The oil was put on the blood, symbolizing the Holy Spirit, who cannot come on human flesh until after the blood has been applied. So it's interesting, as you study these details in the book of Leviticus, a lot of them seem uh, obscure to us until we really understand their teaching devices to understand the redemptive work of the Messiah himself. Every, every one of them refl reflects in some way the work of Jesus Christ. But he went out. The guy didn't do what he was told. He went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city but was without in desert places. And they came to him from every quarter. So this leper that was healed is blabbing it all over town. So the crowds are... Uh, uh, so He draws such a crowd now that he can't minister anymore in the city. So he goes out in the desert and they track him out down there. So that's Mark's summary description of what's going on here. And uh, so there's some lessons here. The obvious lesson is the Son of God came as a servant with authority and with compassion. Praise God. Now, in, in our next session, we're going to study what the servant offers you. And so I want you to read for next time the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer.